Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I am Ted, your host, and for this lecture we are going to pick right back up with part three of our lecture series. And picking right up, picking right back up where we last left off in our last lecture, we discussed the rapid militarization of Nazi Germany. We, we ended our last lecture um, speaking about blitzkrieg, uh, appeasement, and of course the fa failures of the League of Nations. The League of Nations was largely unable to stop any of the military aggressions of the Axis powers. It was unable to uh, come to a peaceful resolution during the Spanish Civil War. And uh, the leaders of Great Britain and France um, had, had largely failed in their efforts to appease Adolf Hitler um, with his uh, territorial designs in Europe. Uh, and, and, when, and when Hitler did decide to go to war, he unleashed this mesmerizing new type of uh, military campaigning. Blitzkrieg, these very fast, rapid strikes, utilizing technology, uh, tanks, and uh, aerial, um, aerial uh, bomber planes, a a aerial, uh, aer aerial planes, um, military aerial planes. Um, well, you, aerial planes is sort of, uh, yeah, is sort of um, just uh, double talk, double speak in a way. Um, core planes are aerial. Aerial is just air. Um, but uh, but but you utilize three of those to very rapidly carve out um, a European empire, um, a, a large um, empire in Europe. And he uh, he particularly amazed the world with his um, campaigns against uh, against um, France. And the United Kingdom, in which he conquered um, the Low Countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and all of France, and, and that sort of set the stage to where we begin um, this this to, to where we begin this lecture, our third lecture. Uh, France was a world power. France was a major colonial player. Uh, France was a highly industrialized nation. She had been one of the great military powers since the days of Charlemagne, since the 800s. Um, really before that, uh, modern France had its roots in the old Frankish kingdom um, that, that was carved out of the dying Roman Empire. Uh, Germany had been a great power only since the days of the Franco-Prussian War. And if you go back uh, beyond that, Germany hadn't, uh, the German states themselves uh, hadn't been world powers, they had just been regional powers. Uh, Brandenburg, Prussia was a, a North, um, was a, uh, a North German and North Central European power. Austria, Hungary had been a, um, had been a, uh, a regional power in, you know, Central Europe. And even looking at the Holy Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire was only uh, a power unto itself. It had largely never really projected that strength elsewhere. The Holy Roman Emperors, um, the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperors, had never been able to conquer or defeat or humble France, either Va Valois, um, Bourbon, or uh, Napoleonic France. The Holy Roman Empire had uh, had largely failed to uh, in any sort of mission to do uh, battle with any of those powers. Um, and uh, the, the one very noticeable um, uh, external throughout the power with the Holy Roman Empire was the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the attack, um, the, the, the Crusades. Frederick Barbarossa drowning and left in two feet of uh, water in his armor. Um, it, it's largely how that's remembered. Um, uh, Yet, um, yet, yet, the Hohenzollerns had transformed Germany into a great power, into a world power, um, with the uh, with their victory in the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, but Germany was quickly downgraded with the First World War. Yet, had managed to annihilate France in, in less than two months, uh, something that had eluded the Imperial German Army for four years. Um, it was one of those moments in history where suddenly the entire situation changes and everything looks differently. Many political leaders and observers awoke to realize that they had uh, not been following the world, uh, the way in which the world was turning. By the summer of 1940, the remnants of the British army had fled from the beaches of Dunkirk and the British Empire uh, remained alone as the only enemy of Nazi Germany. 
Now, later that summer, the Battle of Britain would begin, uh, which were characterized by aerial dueling between German and British fighter, plan uh, fighter planes. Um, and of course, the, the German campaign, uh, campaign centered on attacks on British urban centers like London, Birmingham, and Coventry. Uh, remembered by the, uh, by the British at the Blitz. Um, this was the period in which Winston Churchill gave his most famous speeches about how the United Kingdom would never surrender. Um, and, and Churchill, Churchill had wanted to intervene. He had wanted uh, Roosevelt to intervene and had done all he could to persuade the United States to join his side. Roosevelt was more cautious. Uh, he did send goods across the Atlantic. Um, he sold old Navy destroyers, United States Navy destroyers, to the British Navy. And the North Atlantic became another contested area. Um, the United Kingdom was unable to feed itself. And the German once again turned to submarine warfare to prevent commodities from getting through to the United Kingdom. Just as tanks and warplanes had become more effective tools of war, so too did the submarines. Um, which became much more lethal and acquired a frightening long range uh, capability that it did not have during World War I. The United States Coast Guard began to um, guard supply convoys as they made their trek across the Atlantic. Uh, one of these vessels, um, the Reuben James, was sunk in, 1940, in October of 1941. Excuse me. Uh, the Reuben James was sunk in 1941. Uh, while the United States was still a nominally neutral power. Now, Roosevelt, um, he, he hesitated even with that. There were a number of reasons why he did, why he was so cautious about getting into war. One, the United States had been genuinely scarred by the immense violence associated with World War I. Um, uh, and there were many, many uh, average citizens and many senior politicians who wanted to adhere to the policy of appeasement. Uh, many still believed in the old isolationist policies of the late 18th and 19th uh, century. Uh, many members of the clergy became staunch pacifists and participated in the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a pacifist organization which believed that war... Uh, excuse me again. Uh, which, which believed that at all costs, War must be ended. It must be avoided. Uh, and when the stories first began uh, coming out of Germany regarding the arrest and the transportation and deportation of Nazi enemies, these stories were not uh, believed. They were dismissed. During the First World War, a number of atrocious stories circulated about the behavior of the Imperial German Army uh, that, that were all proven to be untrue. Uh, with the later re re uh, revelation that these stories had been true, uh, at least for the Nazis. Um, th th there were some who saw the need to intercede immediately. Um, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, nie Niebuhr was one of them. Um, still, interest in European intervention was low. There was no clear American interest at risk. Uh, one of the great public figures um, who was against intervention was the aviator Charles, Charles Lindbergh. Former President Hoover was also against uh, intervention, but his reputation was in shambles. It had sunk so low during the, uh, the first two term, terms of Roosevelt's administration that, he, that, that, that uh, whatever Hoover said would be more likely to sway people than, than, uh, than dissuade them. Um, Roosevelt was also cautious because in 1940, it was an election year. 1940 was an election year, and he wanted to maintain a neutral uh, foreign policy. Uh, he did not. Uh, excuse me once again. Um, Roosevelt did not want to alienate any part of the electorate um, because they were going for this unprecedented third term. Uh, there have been many people who have made. Uh, three or more bids for the presidency, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and William Jennings Bryan among them. Washington had retired after his second term, uh, but he could have made a successful bid for a third term. Uh, his choice of two, ther of two terms set an unspoken agreement for his presidential successors that allowed the office to rotate. Now, 
the, the precedent of, of two terms stood until Theodore Roosevelt sought a third term in 1912. Uh, his fifth cousin Franklin was now embarking on a groundbreaking third term which he won by defeating Wendell Wilkie in the 1940 election. Now the New Deal was enormously popular with voters and no Democrat seriously challenged him. His opponent, Wilkie, had previously been a Democrat but had been so dismayed by the dramatic scale of government uh, intervention into the uh, economy and social life of the Republic that, that he um, that, that he switched party, that, that he left the party and became a Republican. Now, Wilkie's campaign was heavily criticized for being subsidized by private corporations who opposed um, uh, New Deal's um, programs, uh, mo most notably the TVA. And journalists mockingly nicknamed Wilkie's campaign uh, the Charge of the Electric Light Brigade, uh, a mock on the, uh, the old Charge of the Light Brigade. Now, Wilkie's uh, policies were not at all different than the platform Roosevelt offered. Although, uh, throughout the fall of 1940, Roosevelt denied that the United States was, uh, might, might go to war, um, which, which largely echoed Wilson's claim in 1916 that the United States was not going to war. Uh, just as the Nazi Soviet pact had bewildered the world when it was announced, so too did Adolf Hitler's uh, decision to attack his erstwhile ally, um, which, which uh, his erstwhile ally, the Soviet Union. Now, these three moments, uh, the Nazi Soviet pact, World War II, um, the Nazi uh, invasion of Germany, and Pearl Harbor, they all occurred uh, between 1939 and 1942. And we can throw in the election of 1940 as well. So those four events all occurred in, in rapid succession and they were all capped off by the attack on Pearl Harbor. These moments radically transformed the American global perceptions. In the long run, it was the invasion of the Soviet Union which ensured the defeat of the Nazis. Uh, they had grossly underestimated the resources that the Russians could throw at them. Um, it has been reasoned that Russia was unconquerable, uh, a, a graveyard for empires. Charles XII of Sweden lost his life and his empire after invading Russia uh, to fight um, Peter uh, I, uh, the self-titled the self Great. Um, Napoleon I of France lost his empire and his great, the greatest army he ever assembled, the Grand Armée, after invading uh, Russia. And then Adolf Hitler invaded. And after years of struggle and nearly one million lives lost, the Nazis were forced, uh, were, were defeated, and, and that largely uh, paved the way for, for a, a, a sleek invasion of Berlin. Uh, he made very rapid advancements across Western Russia. The Nazi initial uh, attack encountered virtually no resistance. They, they steamrolled through um, Eastern Poland, Western Russia, the Baltic states. Um, he made very rapid pro uh, advancement, very, very rapid uh, progression. Um, and he thought that German Hit Hitler, Adolf Hitler thought that German technological breakthroughs would be enough to overcome the Russians. Uh, at first, German technology um, did make a, a great difference. It made an, a, a tremendous difference. But the long distance supply lies and terrible winter conditions stalled the Nazi uh, Russian offensive. The Eastern Front became mired in years long desperate struggle which eventually claimed the lives of roughly 90% of all the German war dead in World War II. The toll was equally devastating on the Russian population. The Eastern Front became synonymous with death and destruction. Now, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the event that brought the United States into uh, World War II, into, uh, into the great global um, struggle, 
had been a long time in the making. It was not a, a surprise attack. It was not a, uh, a quick decision. It, it had been a long time in the making. Uh, the Japanese Empire had been the first East Asian nation to industrialize, uh, winning a decisive victory at the beginning of the 20th century over the Russians in 1905. Uh, the Japanese had, during the 19th century, modernized under the uh, auspices of the German Empire and continued to grow after the German collapse in 1918. Uh, the Japanese, um, had noted earlier, continued to grow. Uh, they invaded China and other Pacific territories. Uh, there was a growing awareness that a showdown between the United States and Japan was coming. Uh, both had been expanding in the Pacific since the early 20th century. Uh, there was a belief that a particularly devastating attack against the United States um, would, would knock her out of contention. In the Pacific, the Japanese thought that the United States would buckle uh, after an attack um, and, and recede from the Pacific. And with that, we shall break. With that, we shall break uh, and we shall come back with part four of our of our lecture of our of our um covering of world war ii and we shall begin with the attack on pearl harbor so we're finally getting to the meat and potatoes of uh of, of action from uh, from the united states perspective from um domestic uh in-class students um anticipation of, of world war of world war ii and as always i'm ted hit like subscribe comment let me know what you guys thought about this lecture um let me know your opinions on what we discussed, and I'll see you guys next time.